Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for clicking on LASOS. That's LA Strategies or Solutions. This is a program of IPS, which is Institute for Public Strategies, and a project of the West Hollywood Project as well. I'm Cynthia Nickerson, and today we're talking about meth. Unfortunately, the meth uh, epidemic is still an epidemic, especially now with the problems posed by the pandemic. So I'm speaking to someone who has struggled through addiction and is now doing great, has a wonderful story to tell and very inspiring. Hello, this is Melissa McCracken. Hello, Melissa. Hello, how are you doing, Cynthia? Excellent, thank you so much for joining me. All right, first of all, can you, in a nutshell, kind of explain uh, how far back in your life, what your age group was when you started using substances, and then um, what, what happened to you? Sure, um, you know, uh, my story and my journey kind of begins in high school. And, um, you know, I was in and out of the home and I ended up clicking up with the right people, so to speak, for an addict. And I ended up being introduced to math at 15. Wow. Okay. So from 15 through how many years did it take, did you go through that before you finally um, got treatment? You know, it, it took almost 17 years uh, in and out of addiction, in and out of jail, um, just really suffering from what I didn't know to be addiction actually until I entered into a treatment facility. I just thought there was something wrong with me. And I was so, I was so ashamed to ask for help and help really wasn't available because I was hanging out with a lot of drug users. So nobody really knew about help in that circle. Um, so, you know, it was a very, uh, it was a very painful process. It was, I'm taking a moment here, Cynthia, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the struggle of addiction and like the stigma that surrounds it is something that I am a fierce advocate of against because I have seen so many people just not know where to get help, not know who to talk to. And I was definitely one of those people. I mean, my addiction, um, you know, took me to the streets of Los Angeles to where, you know, I'm using drugs and tents on the side of freeway where I never thought I would ever be. Like, I never had that vision planned for my life. It didn't look like that. But um, once in the throes and the grips of a crippling addiction, you really see no way out. And there was really no possibility. Um, so... How did you get out? You know, I, I was fortunate enough, and I do call this a moment of grace, um, when I was arrested for the last time. And, you know, it just gave me enough time away from the drug to kind of get clean and sober physically. Although I wasn't emotionally, spiritually, or mentally sober, I was physically sober long enough to realize that I had a problem. And I was sentenced to a 90-day program by a judge who I, to this day, I mean, she, I hold her in the highest regard because that is the very thing that saved my life. Wow. And now you're a treatment counselor. You help others. Um, it seems like a natural fit for you. What are you seeing when you talk to people who are struggling? Um, are they dealing with kind of the same issues that you dealt with? Are you seeing people who talk about where we are now in life with this ep uh, pandemic? Is that um, uh, part of the reason why people are struggling? Yeah, I think that's a huge part of the reason that people are, are struggling because addiction in itself is something is very isolating. So, you know, that's just kind of one of the common characteristics of it. It's like I pull away from community. I pull away from services. I pull away from people, family, and all support systems in order to use. And now that, you know, with the advent of COVID here and living in a, in a pandemic, we've seen relapse rates on the rise by, I think, as high as 33%. So alcohol sales and consumption has gone up 150%. So I think people that were used to relying on connection uh, to oppose addiction are finding it very difficult in today's world to find a safe place to connect. And yes, there are Zoom services and things like that, but you know that relational healing that was so essential to me what do you do without that? And looking at like, okay, so how can I make sobriety different? How can, how can I make it, you know, kind of fun again? Because going to meetings and being a part of sober communities, that was a very fun experience for me com coming into recovery. And, and that was so necessary and so needed. So 
it's like kind of, I think we're all having to think outside of the box with this consciousness of a pandemic around us. And, you know, there, there are places that you can go. There are outdoor areas where you can find community and connection. And, you know, working in the treatment field, we've definitely seen a surge in admits. And I think what COVID has, has offered is resources for people that may not necessarily have had them before. Because with like virtual IOPs happening and, and things like that going on around the country. People what is, excuse me, Melissa, an IOP for people who may not know that term. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so, you know, I think a lot of um, treatment modalities have moved online because of course we're not doing much in person. So, you know, with that being one of the differences in COVID, I think that people that may have been really ashamed to go to treatment or still carried their own stigma or bias about being an addict can kind of drop in on these programs. And I, and I see a lot of harm reduction happening. Maybe when people are abusing drugs, now they're more likely to join a virtual uh, treatment program versus when they're all the way down the scale as my experience was. So I'm seeing that actually be really helpful to those who are on the cusps and undecided that they they have access and they're being exposed in, in a much bigger way. So what would you say to people who have a family member, a loved one, a, a close friend um, who is struggling and that uh, person doesn't know how to help them? I think we all want to help, but we don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I think when it comes for our family members, friends, and you're, you're watching your loved one, like you struggle in either drug abuse or addiction, I think the greatest thing that you can do is let go of judgment, let go of your own ideas about what addiction is. And it is a disease just like any other that's out there. It's like, you know, I'm not shaming someone if they have cancer for going to get chemotherapy. And addiction is a deadly disease. It, it, is, it is lethal if left untreated. So keeping that in mind, that this is not something that I choose. This was, like I said, this was never on the game plan for my, for my life and what I imagined it would look like. But, you know, this is, this is not a choice. Right. And if you can leave that judgment at the door and invite someone into a conversation of their own healing and their own possibility as a person in their life, it's 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 really extending just the invitation for a different dialogue and a different conversation. Like just that one opening in the window. I mean, that gets people that puts it in people's mind that there is help available and that I am loved and that I am supported and whatever I need can be made available to me. And finally, what would you say to the community as a whole, um, LA County, LA, maybe West Hollywood in specific, as how we can embrace this situation and get a handle on it from a community perspective? Mm -hmm. You know, I think we need to drive more awareness as a community. I think specifically in the LGBT population, there's kind of a celebration of the party scene and, you know, a glamorization and, you know, this romantic ideal of like, oh, I'm going out and using once a month, then so I don't have a problem. Well, here's what I know from experience, both on the clin clinical front and personal front, that once a month party can take a quick turn to being becoming a daily user. So I think driving awareness of how this is impacting our community, how this is creating division in our community, and how we're actually talking about drug abuse. Are we having conversations around the problem of drug abuse? Or are we having conversations that are recovered, that are around the solutions that are available within our community? All right very positive words. We appreciate that. Our community desperately needs the help. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you everyone for watching. I'm Cynthia Nickerson. This is LASOS. See you next time.